This is the second talk in a series on basic surgical critical care. Today we're going to first discuss some basic cardiac physiology. We'll then move on to discuss how we might monitor these basic functions. Finally, we'll finish up by discussing pharmacologic interventions and mechanical assist devices. Perhaps the most basic piece of information that we would like to know about a sick patient is, what is their cardiac output? The equation for cardiac output is simple enough. It's stroke volume times heart rate. Heart rate is easily obtained, but stroke volume is surprisingly difficult to know. Stroke volume is defined as the amount of blood in the ventricle right before contraction, less the amount of blood that remains in the ventricle after contraction. In other words, it's the end diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume. A normal heart ejects between 50 and 100 cc's of blood into the circulation with each beat. Another way to look at this relationship is the ejection fraction which is defined as the ratio between the end systolic volume and the end diastolic volume. A normal ejection fraction is between 50 and 70%. And so a patient with significant cardiac failure will have an ejection fraction of 30% or less. The only way to obtain the end systolic volume and end diastolic volume measurements in real time is by continuous echocardiography, but this is a technology that's not routinely available in most ICUs at present. Besides being difficult to measure, stroke volume is difficult to estimate or predict because it is a function of three variables that are not completely independent of each other. These variables are preload, afterload, and contractility. We'll discuss each of these in turn. Preload is defined as the force acting on a muscle just before contraction. For our purposes, we can think of preload as the stretch on a muscle fiber. As we stretch a muscle, its ability to generate force increases. However, this can be overdone. There is a point where too much stretching leads to worsening performance. In cardiac physiology, the end diastolic volume is the preload on cardiac muscle fibers. There are two primary determinants of preload. The first is the intravascular volume status of the patient. Hypovolemic patients generally have a lower preload, whereas patients in congestive heart failure have higher preloads. The second determinant of preload is venous return which is largely independent of volume status. Venous return itself has two primary components. The first is the intrinsic venous tone or capacitance. If the capacitance is increased, the venous reservoir is larger and blood tends to pool on the venous side of the circulation, reducing venous return to the heart. Commonly used drugs like nitroglycerin or morphine decrease venous return, making them useful in treating congestive heart failure. Epinephrine, on the other hand, reduces capacitance and serves to increase venous return. Increased intrathoracic pressure also decreases venous return to the heart. Some common examples of this phenomenon are positive pressure ventilation, and high levels of PEEP. Besides preload, stroke volume is also dependent upon afterload. Physiologists define afterload as the tension that a muscle must develop before it can begin to shorten or contract. To use a common experience, if you've ever lifted a heavy object off the ground, you know that you have to develop a certain amount of muscular tension before the weight begins to move. In the heart, the SVR is analogous to the weight. As the SVR increases, 
the heart must do more work to raise intraventricular pressure above the SVR. Ultimately, this means that less work will be available to eject blood into the aorta. The figure shown here shows this uh, quite well. As afterload increases, we see that stroke volume decreases and the poorly functioning heart is much more affected than the normal heart. SVR is a calculated value. It is defined as the change in pressure over the systemic circulation divided by the flow through the systemic circulation. And so to get this value, we need to know the mean arterial pressure, the CVP, and the cardiac output. And so we definitely are going to need a way to measure cardiac output. Stroke volume is also critically dependent upon the intrinsic inotropic state of the myocardium. Clinically, many different hormones or drugs can positively or negatively affect myocardial contractility. Ejection fraction is probably the best marker of ventricular function, but it is really difficult to measure clinically. Heart rate and rhythm are also important in determining cardiac output. In general, cardiac output increases as the heart rate increases, but there are limits to this effect. At heart rates greater than 140 beats per minute, there isn't enough time for efficient ventricular filling and cardiac output actually decreases at these higher heart rates. Sinus rhythm is also important to cardiac performance. It's the coordinated depolarization between the atria and ventricles that leads to optimal ventricular filling. In atrial fibrillation, even if the ventricular response rate is controlled, the loss of atrial contraction leads to decreased ventricular filling and decreased cardiac output in many patients. Cardiac output is also dependent upon ventricular compliance. Compliance is defined as the ratio between volume change and pressure change. Compliance can be thought of as the stiffness of the ventricle, and stiff ventricles are harder to fill, leading to decreased cardiac output. Some common clinical scenarios resulting in poorly compliant ventricles include myocardial infarctions, pericarditis, pericardial effusions or tamponade, and restrictive cardiomyopathies. Let's now start discussing cardiac monitoring. The two clinical cardiac variables that we are most interested in knowing are the volume status of the patient and their cardiac output. The goal of cardiac monitoring is to obtain accurate data regarding these variables. Once we have accurate data, then rational therapeutic decisions can be made. As we'll see, obtaining accurate cardiac data is an ongoing and still unsolved challenge. The central venous pressure has long been used as a marker for volume status or preload. CVP monitoring requires placement of a central line with the tip in the superior vena cava, or better yet, in the right atrium. The first thing to note is that we are now using a pressure measurement as a surrogate for volume status. The volume that the CVP is estimating is the right ventricular and diastolic volume. The second assumption that CVP measurement makes is that the right ventricular and diastolic volume is the same as the left ventricular end diastolic volume. Unless the patient has an intracardiac shunt, this is a safe assumption. Elevated CVP measurements are notoriously difficult to interpret because there are other reasons for this elevation besides volume overload. If our patient has tricuspid valve regurgitation, the CVP will be high. 
This will also be true if they're on positive pressure ventilation with high airway pressures or high levels of PEEP. And lastly, if the patient has had a previous right ventricular infarction, the ventricular compliance will be low, resulting in a high CVP. On the other hand, a low CVP is generally reliable for hypovolemia since there really are no other causes for the low CVP measurement. The pulmonary artery, or Swan-Gans catheter, is an invasive cardiac monitoring device that was extensively used in surgical ICUs in the 1980s through the early 1990s. This device allowed for the direct measurement of the cardiac output as well as the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. The pulmonary artery catheter is hardly used at all now. Even though this device failed to improve clinical outcomes, the reasons for its failure are worth discussing. This picture shows the placement of a pulmonary artery catheter. The catheter is passed through the right heart until it lodges in a distal pulmonary artery. Pressures measured in the pulmonary artery should better reflect the filling pressures in the left atrium and left ventricle. In addition, cardiac output is measured by the thermodilution technique, where a known volume and temperature of cold saline is injected proximally, and the temperature drop is measured distally. An attached computer can then calculate the cardiac output. This picture shows the pressure tracing that the person placing the pulmonary artery catheter would see as they advance the catheter. The first obvious landmark is when the catheter reaches the right ventricle. Here the systolic pressure jumps up to 20 to 25 millimeters of mercury and the diastolic pressure remains zero. When the catheter reaches the pulmonary artery, we see the diastolic pressure increase to 10 millimeters of mercury. This reflects the closure of the pulmonary valve. At this point, the distal balloon is inflated and the catheter is slowly advanced or floated until it lodges in a small branch of the pulmonary artery. The pressures recorded here represent the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which is a surrogate measurement of the left atrial pressure. The purpose of the pulmonary artery catheter is that it can provide hemodynamic data that can't be obtained from clinical examination. Some of the measured values obtained from a pulmonary artery catheter include the CVP, pulmonary artery pressures, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, the cardiac output, and the mixed venous O2 saturation. The systemic vascular resistance is a calculated value that requires the CVP, mean arterial pressure, and cardiac output as inputs. The goal of the catheter is to allow rational decisions to be made regarding selecting various therapies. And importantly, another goal is that the impact of the therapies can be measured and modified as necessary. Pulmonary artery catheters had a lot of promise to use measured data to select, monitor, and modify therapy in the ICU. However, by the mid-1990s, many ICU doctors doubted the utility of these catheters to improve clinical outcomes. A landmark study in 1996 by Connor concluded that pulmonary artery catheters placed within 24 hours of ICU admission actually led to increased mortality. This study was subsequently confirmed in multiple randomized controlled trials, and none of these controlled trials ever showed a benefit to the pulmonary artery catheter. So it's fair to question what went wrong. Why? weren't pulmonary artery catheters effective. And there's 
no doubt more than one explanation. The first is that the catheter itself has a morbidity and actual mortality rate. Right heart catheterization is dangerous to patients. Probably the biggest problem is that the data that's generated is now known to be inaccurate. We know that the measured pulmonary capillary wedge pressure really doesn't reflect the patient's reality. Cardiac output can be off by as much as 80% by the thermodilution technique. So it's likely that we're just getting inaccurate data. Another problem is that clinicians, trained clinicians, have been shown to misinterpret the data as well. And so poor decisions were being made on inaccurate data. And lastly, it's probably fair to question that even if the data obtained is accurate, it may not actually be the data we want when we're managing critically ill patients. In retrospect, I think it was a really big mistake not to do randomized controlled trials when the pulmonary artery catheter was first introduced into clinical medicine. I think physicians were so happy to have measured hemodynamic data that they really didn't question its accuracy. This has proved to be a big mistake. One big issue with pulmonary artery catheters is that they have a significant morbidity and mortality rate. The catheter is arrhythmogenic and is known to cause a right bundle branch block. So if they have a pre-existing left bundle branch block, you risk throwing them into complete heart block, which would ultimately require a pacemaker. The catheter is prone to coiling or nodding in the pulmonary artery, and this might require invasive radiology or even a thoracotomy or sternotomy to untangle this catheter. Wedging the balloon in the pulmonary artery can lead to rupture of a pulmonary artery branch and subsequent hemorrhage. The catheter has to pass through the tricuspid and pulmonary valves, and so valve damage is possible as well. These catheters are fragile, and they were known to break into two or more pieces. And lastly, line complications are a big deal. Besides access complications like pneumothorax, vascular complications were significant. These catheters are introduced through a large sheath, and so venous and in particular arterial injuries could be very, very dangerous. In the left image, we see the normal positioning of a pulmonary artery catheter. On the right, we see one that is terribly knotted and twisted up. Before this catheter could be removed, it would have to be untangled. This sometimes was accomplished in the IR suite, but in other times, it may require a surgical approach. In this image, we see a pulmonary artery rupture. This could be a lethal event especially in a patient who was anticoagulated. Before we move on, let's better define the pulmonary artery wedge pressure and cardiac output measurements. When the pulmonary artery catheter balloon wedges in a small pulmonary artery, a pressure can be measured. This pressure goes by several names. It's sometimes called just the wedge pressure, and sometimes it's called the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. With the balloon inflated, there is a static column of blood from the balloon to the left atrium. And so the wedge pressure is an approximation of the left atrial pressure. The left atrial pressure, in turn, is an approximation of the left ventricular end diastolic pressure which in turn is an approximation of the left ventricular end diastolic volume. Remember, it's the left ventricular end diastolic volume that we really care about. 
as this represents the filling pressure or preload in the left ventricle. The basic idea is that if the wedge pressure is low, then the preload will be low as well. The clinical assumption behind all of this is that patients with a low wedge pressure should increase their cardiac output after a fluid bolus. We now know that the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure measurements are inaccurate and cannot be relied on to estimate left ventricular filling pressures or preload. There are many potential ways for the wedge pressure to be inaccurate. One basic problem is that patient positioning has never been standardized, and so measurements obtained in the supine, prone, head up, or head down positions will all be different. Most patients who have a pulmonary artery catheter in place are also being mechanically ventilated, and high airway pressures or high levels of PEEP will give misleading wedge pressure values. Cardiac pathology like mitral valve regurgitation or stenosis and decreased left ventricular compliance will also lead to inaccurate wedge pressure measurements. The other common hemodynamic parameter obtained from the pulmonary artery catheter is cardiac output. When this catheter was first introduced, the cardiac output was stated to have an accuracy of plus or minus 15%. However, these initial results have never been reproduced, and it's likely that the accuracy is much worse than this. The cardiac output is measured by thermodilution. A known volume and temperature of cold saline is injected into the right atrium, and a change in temperature is measured in the pulmonary artery. The basic idea is that the greater the temperature drop, the lower the cardiac output. There are many ways for the cardiac output measurement to be inaccurate. The pulmonary artery catheter measures right ventricular output. And so patients with tricuspid regurgitation will have inaccurate measurements. Tricuspid regurgitation is actually quite common in the general population and may be as high as 70% in elderly patients. There are also many possible technical errors that can happen during a cardiac output measurement. You may record an inaccurate initial temperature or volume of saline, and how fast or slow you inject the saline will definitely change the cardiac output values. Also, the stroke volume can vary as much as 50% at various phases of the respiratory cycle. And so to try to smooth out all these different technical errors, multiple measurements need to be taken and averaged. Ideally, at least three measurements should be done each measurement cycle. I think it's fair to say that the pulmonary artery catheter did not live up to its early promise. The measured pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and cardiac output are too inaccurate to be relied upon, which means that calculated values like systemic vascular resistance are inaccurate as well. Nevertheless, if we had more accurate data, the assumption is that we could make better clinical decisions for our patients. We face many difficult circumstances in the surgical ICU where the traditional clinical parameters don't always lead us in the right direction. We sometimes have patients that are oliguric in spite of what we feel like is adequate fluid resuscitation. So the question comes up, do they need more fluid or do they possibly need to be diuresed? We take care of patients who've had post-operative MIs and post-operative valve failures, and we would often like to know what their cardiac output is. We have patients with a whited out chest X-ray, and it's not always clear whether this is related to ARDS or cardiogenic pulmonary edema. 
And in patients with ARDS, we would often like to know what the effects of high-level PEEP are on their cardiac output. So let's take a look at some of the more modern approaches to assessing volume status, fluid responsiveness, and cardiac output. I would say that the two most common questions that we ask about our ICU patients is, number one, what is their volume status? And number two, will they respond positively to a fluid challenge? One approach to answering these questions is to measure pulse pressure. Pulse pressure is easily obtained and only requires intraarterial blood pressure monitoring. The pulse pressure is simply the difference between the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure. In patients who are being mechanically ventilated, there will be an appreciable pulse pressure difference during expiration and inspiration. This difference is the pulse pressure variation. If the pulse pressure variation is greater than 13% or so, this predicts volume responsiveness, whereas a pulse pressure variation less than 9% predicts volume unresponsiveness. Values in between are a so-called gray area. There are many limitations, however, to using pulse pressure variation to measure fluid responsiveness. The first and most obvious limitation is that the patient must be on the ventilator. They also must be in normal sinus rhythm and they can't have right ventricular or left ventricular failure. Lastly, if they're on a low tidal volume protocol, this will lead to spurious results as well. Passive leg raising is a test that predicts whether cardiac output will increase with volume expansion. It mimics a fluid challenge by auto-transfusing blood pooled in the lower extremities. Unlike the pulse pressure variation test that we just talked about, this test can be used in spontaneous breathing patients or in patients receiving low tidal volume ventilation. It can also be used in patients with arrhythmias. On the other hand, this test is likely going to be impossible in complicated trauma patients with pelvic fractures or lower extremity injuries. The technique involved in this test is very important to carry out faithfully. The starting position must be with the trunk elevated to 45 degrees with the leg supine. You then use the bed controls to lower the trunk to supine and raise the legs to 45 degrees. Importantly, you must now have a way to measure the cardiac output in real time. We'll talk about a few of those ways in just a bit. But this test doesn't use blood pressure or pulse pressure variation as an endpoint. And a 10% increase in cardiac output predicts fluid responsiveness. Yet another way to predict volume responsiveness is to measure the size of the inferior vena cava. Two observations about IVC size can be made. The first is that cable size correlates with right atrial pressure. The second is that the diameter of the cava changes with respiration. In a mechanically ventilated patient, which will be our more normal circumstance, the IVC size will decrease with inspiration and it will increase with expiration. A change in IVC diameter of 12 to 18% during the respiratory cycle predicts fluid responsiveness. Now, one major limitation of this technique is that all measurements must be made by transthoracic echocardiography, which may not be widely available. Besides volume responsiveness, the other cardiac parameter that we would often like to know is cardiac output. There are several different approaches to this in clinical use, but they all have their limitations. Arterial waveform analysis uses the arterial pressure waveform 
as input into a software model of the systemic circulation. The arterial waveform that we see on the monitor is based on the interplay between stroke volume, systemic vascular resistance, and vascular compliance. We typically won't know what these numbers are, and so these inputs into the model must be estimated. This will lead to some inherent inaccuracies in the cardiac output. Lastly, the different manufacturers of these devices use their own proprietary algorithms and software, and this makes any independent validation difficult to impossible. Another way to measure cardiac output is to measure blood flow rate in the aorta. This will require a probe placed in the esophagus if the patient is intubated and sedated or on the anterior chest in an awake patient. One particular challenge with this technique is that the probe has to be correctly positioned. It must be exactly aligned with the direction of blood flow to give an accurate result. Continuous transesophageal echocardiography is the monitoring technique that gives us the best information regarding left ventricular end diastolic volume, ejection fraction, and cardiac output. But it also has multiple limitations. The patients must be sedated and intubated, and the probe can only be left in place for a maximum of 72 hours or else you risk esophageal necrosis. The devices are very expensive and their use requires considerable skill and training to produce reliable results. Let's switch gears now and go over some of the cardiovascular pharmacologic interventions that we can make on our ICU patients. Most of the cardiovascular drugs we use in the ICU work by binding to specific cell membrane receptors. Catecholamines bind to specific adrenergic receptors, and each receptor is responsible for different biologic effects. The alpha-1 receptors are located on both arterial and venous smooth muscle, and stimulation of these receptors leads to increased vascular tone. The beta-1 receptors are located in the heart, and stimulation of these receptors leads to increased myocardial contractility, as well as increased heart rate and increased conduction velocity. The beta-2 receptors are located on non-vascular smooth muscle. For our purposes, the most important tissue will be the bronchial tissue, and stimulation of beta-2 receptors leads to decreased bronchial tone. This is very important in patients who have bronchospasm or severe asthma. Dopamine receptor activation can cause multiple effects on cardiovascular function. Dopamine receptors are found on many different tissues and their effects are both dose and organ dependent. There are two types of vasopressin receptors. The V1 receptors are located on vascular smooth muscle, and stimulation leads to vasoconstriction. The V2 receptors are located on the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct of the kidney. Stimulation of these receptors leads to increased water retention. Let's now discuss some of the most common cardiovascular drugs used in the surgical intensive care unit. We'll start off with the inotropic agents. Epinephrine is the primary catecholamine produced by the adrenal medulla. It stimulates both the alpha and beta receptors equally. This makes it difficult to predict the overall effect of epinephrine. You may use it to increase myocardial contractility and heart rate with the intent of increasing cardiac output. However, if the alpha effects predominate, you may actually get a decreased cardiac output. 
Norepinephrine is the immediate precursor to epinephrine in the adrenal medulla. It has very potent alpha-1 effects, which leads to vasoconstriction. Norepinephrine also has minimal cardiac effects, and so we don't see much in the way of increased heart rate or increased myocardial contractility. Norepinephrine is usually the first drug chosen to treat persistent hypotension in septic shock. Norepinephrine also finds uses in treating neurogenic shock as well. One caveat with norepinephrine is that it may decrease cardiac output. The mechanism for this is that increased smooth muscle tone will lead to increased afterload. Dopamine is a unique drug in that it has different effects depending on its dosage. At low doses, doses between 1 to 4 micrograms per kilogram per minute, dopamine acts on specific dopamine receptors, which are located on renal and mesenteric vessels. Stimulation of these receptors leads to vasodilation. It was very common in my training days for our sick patients to be put on a so-called renal dose of dopamine. The idea was to keep the kidney well perfused and help support urine output. At doses between 5 to 10 mics per kilogram per minute, dopamine acts on the beta-1 receptors, and this will lead to increased heart rate and increased myocardial contractility. At doses greater than 10 mics per kilogram per minute, dopamine has predominantly alpha-1 effects. Again, when I was training, we used dopamine very routinely as our first-line drug for treating septic shock. Dopamine is not used much anymore in the surgical intensive care unit. There are many problems associated with its usage. There's never been any studies that show that renal dose dopamine leads to improved renal function. But perhaps the main problem with dopamine is that it causes a significant tachycardia, which can lead to increased myocardial oxygen consumption. And it's also extremely arrhythmogenic. Initially, you might see frequent PVCs and short runs of VTAC but this can progress to more sustained runs of VTAC and even ventricular fibrillation. The bottom line is that nowadays there are just better drugs to use than dopamine. Dobutamine is a synthetic amine that functions as a pure beta agonist. It's an extremely powerful inotropic agent and its most common clinical use is to treat patients with a poor ejection fraction from congestive heart failure. Dobutamine will cause increased myocardial oxygen consumption because of its beta-1 effects. This may worsen myocardial ischemia if it's present. Milrinone is a completely different type of drug. It is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, not an amine. It works by increasing cardiac contractility, and it also reduces afterload by decreasing systemic vascular resistance and pulmonary vascular resistance. One disadvantage of milrinone is that it has a very long half-life. And so if you get excessive vasodilation and hypotension from its afterload reducing effects, you may need to add norepinephrine until the drug wears off. Milrinone is often paired with dobutamine to increase cardiac contractility in patients with extremely severe congestive heart failure. Although in surgery we are often trying to support blood pressure by using drugs to increase vascular tone, there will be occasions when we need to use vasodilators as well. Nitroprusside or nipride is a smooth muscle vasodilator that affects all the vascular beds roughly equally. 
It's most commonly used in the SICU when afterload reduction is necessary to reduce the work of the ischemic or failing heart. One important thing to keep in mind is that nipride shouldn't be used for more than 48 hours since one of its metabolic byproducts is cyanide, which can accumulate over this time frame. Nitroglycerin is commonly used in patients who have myocardial ischemia. At low doses, nitroglycerin improves cardiac blood flow and causes venous dilation. Venous dilation reduces preload, which in turn decreases myocardial oxygen consumption. At higher doses, nitroglycerin functions as an arterial vasodilator as well. One side effect of nitroglycerin is tachyphylaxis, which means that increasing doses are required to get the same therapeutic effect. Calcium channel blockers have several different uses in the SICU. They are used to treat hypertension as well as cardiac ischemia. Their primary use, however, is in the treatment of supraventricular arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. They do this by prolonging conduction through the AV node. One potential side effect of calcium channel blockers is that they function as a negative inotropic agent. Let's finish this discussion by briefly mentioning a few mechanical devices that can be used to temporarily support a failing heart. The intraaortic balloon pump is used in patients with refractory cardiogenic shock. The device is inserted via the femoral artery and positioned in the descending aorta. The device is able to coordinate with the cardiac cycle, and so you get rapid balloon inflation during diastole. This leads to increased diastolic pressures, which in turn should lead to better coronary artery perfusion and better peripheral perfusion. The balloon then deflates right before systole. This will result in decreased afterload and correspondingly increased cardiac output. There are several different types of left ventricular assist devices in clinical use. This picture shows one that has been surgically implanted. Blood is removed from the left atrium or left ventricle and pumped back into the aorta. This device is most commonly used as a bridge to cardiac transplantation, but some patients will receive long-term treatment with an LVAD if they're not transplant candidates. Here is my list of references that I use to put together this talk. The URL for this course's website is shown here, as well as a few links to some of my other talks on basic surgical care for surgery residents and medical students. I also have a number of other YouTube videos on basic surgical care that you can check out as well. Thanks again for your attention.